Here at NGC, we don't often on Sunday morning say, help, we need more volunteers. Why is that? Welcome to the To Be The Church podcast, where we explore what it looks like to truly be the church in today's culture. Happy Easter, boys. Today's Good Friday, as it's coming out. Yeah. Um, any, uh, any like solid traditions you guys have for your families or anything like that for Easter? We go to church on Good Friday and on Easter Sunday. So it's yeah. like a double that well, we go Saturday too. So Oh, you go Saturday? Yeah. So we're, Do you go Maundy Thursday? Mm, there is something at CW tonight, but uh, we are recording this on Maundy Thursday. It's true. What's at CW? You did a Maundy thing? A prayer night. Just praying for the weekend. Whoa. Nice. But nice. it's totally volunteer initiated and led, which is pretty cool. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. Wow. Maundy. Yeah. Any other good? Uh, my, I mean, yeah, we all obviously the three of us have the tradition of working a lot of hours that we mm-hmm. do. Yeah, but we usually have ham. I like to eat. Yeah, that's a pretty big. <laughs> that's a pretty big thing on Easter. The Easter yeah. ham, yeah, right? honey baked action. Yeah, I don't know. Well, that was a great conversation about yeah. Easter. <laughs> I'm glad we did that. That was good. Yep. All right, we got a question from a listener. Let's do this. The million dollar question for every local church: How do you spur on the cong- congregants to volunteer? Would you talk about your governing principles and subsequent methods for recruiting volunteers to serve in the various ministries of NGC? I'm curious why I hardly ever hear public mention of the need and request for people to serve. I figured you all been in this for a while, so if you're not straight up asking for volunteers publicly on a regular basis, then you have a reason. I realize that certain ministries do get a mention now and then, and the topic of service will show up in the sermon text. I'm not saying we never do it publicly, but just so seldom that it raises the question. That's a good question. So... Would you talk about the governing principles and subsequent methods for recruiting volunteers to serve in various ministries at NGC? Uh, one of the reasons that if you're at NGC, particularly East Vancouver, I can't speak for C-dubs. Please you don't. can. Yeah. <laughs> How dare you speak <laughs> yeah. for CW? Um, at East Vancouver specifically, the reason you don't hear the public appeal for volunteers very often is because our methods of recruiting and kind of, I would argue, maybe sort of our governing principles in that regard uh, dictate that we don't, uh, we don't make public appeals from the Sunday morning pulpit for volunteers very often. I mean, we will, it, it might come into the play if the message is that's an application point from a message or whatever else, but um, it's not in my view, um, and, and I would say in the view of our leadership here at East Vancouver, um, it's not a good strategy for for recruiting volunteers. The the public appeal from the front as your as your primary way of recruiting volunteers is a very very poor strategy. The strategies we use are uh, relational discipleship, um, team leadership for so like our staff members uh, specifically and and our key volunteers as well. Uh, our leadership writ large, whether volunteer or paid, um, they work in recruiting people in connecting with people and plugging them into serve obviously the membership process to come here and become a member teaches all about that kind of stuff and then um you know even as a part of our membership interviews tyler you probably know the our more recent stuff better than that but like as a part of our membership interviews and even our membership renewals on an annual basis Mm -hmm. we have those questions on serving and it's like we the entire job of our staff is to equip people to do ministry and so we're constantly talking about that, measuring those metrics, you know, and, and emphasizing that. So it's, it's a way more effective strategy. Like say I'm a youth pastor, um, connecting with people, uh, parents and others building, uh, communication mechanisms, whether it's an email list that I email weekly or youth staff meetings that I have monthly with serving lunch and recruiting people through that way. Those are the effective ways to get people to serve long-term standing up front on a Sunday morning gathering and be like, we need youth volunteers. That that's just not the an effective way to do it, particularly in a large church. And so, um, it's, um, yeah. And the other, the other aspect of that too, is like, I think if you do too much of that, no matter what size church you're at, you can become the Christian radio station that like every, uh, every commercial break is like begging for money, you know? And it's like, okay, listeners like you, you know, and, and if you listen to a lot of Christian radio, you kind of, I guess are used to that a little bit, but um, you know, I, I just don't think that's effective. You preach it, you equip people in membership you emphasize those things, but you have to have leaders, whether they're paid or not, who are recruiters and equippers, and that's the real key to uh, 
longevity in 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 uh, people serving in ministry, but also I think it's the most effective. Way yeah, to do I, it. I think that when the last sentence you had there, it, the key to longevity. Yeah, because you may get a flash in the pan from a plea on Sunday morning, you know, um, but. Our, our experience, and I, there's probably data to prove this like as well out there, but definitely from our experience um, has been like, you may get an influx and then right back to where you were. Yeah. Um, where, uh, you know, and we're in a pretty healthy spot as a church, just overall in general. Now, there, sure, there are ministries that's like, oh, they could definitely use more volunteers and ministries who it's like have more volunteers than they know what to do with. Um, but it is so much healthier for everyone involved, for the people serving for the people being ministered to for the team mates and members um whenever people are serving in areas that are truly passionate about rather than just like oh we just need that covered obligation right? yeah and yeah. so um if we hit a point where it was like oh we well we, we categorize ministries even differently so if we had a point where it was like we can't have the nursery today because there's not enough volunteers we would we would first hit our leaders hey who can we get Nursery is vital. We need to have it. So we're going to do it. There, probably That's probably 25% of our ministries. The other 75%, it's like if we don't have the volunteer base to to run it effectively, we're just not going to do it. Yeah. Um, or we're going to do it in a different way that doesn't utilize or doesn't need as many volunteers. Because again, the, the more uh, people are passionate about and want to dive into that ministry, the healthier everyone involved is going to be, not just that volunteer, but also the people they're working alongside, the, the kids or the church members or whoever it is they're ministering to. Um, and, uh, the, like the, oh no, we need more of this yeah. from a Sunday morning, uh, doesn't attract those people. <laughs> um, exactly. Uh, those, yeah. And so, um, yeah, any, I mean, I can talk more about our processes, but Ben, I, I just had one thing to say quick before we, we go to Ben, the, the vision, like vision and gifting driving people's motivation to serve was what you're talking about rather than obligation. Mm -hmm. So this is, and that's, that is truly the motivator for, and, and, and Christians, it's also a discipleship issue. Like, you know, if you're a Christian and the longer you're a Christian, you understand that like we serve, this is what we do. Right. And it's, it's part of being a, it's part of being a Christian. It's part of the fruit of being a Christian is, is to, is to uh, serve as the body of Christ. And so, uh, it's also a discipleship thing. That's one of the governing principles of it is that it's a matter of discipleship. And as we grow and make disciples through the preaching of the word and and all those different means that the Lord gives us, um, people people uh, begin to want to plug in. And then you have leaders in those areas that plug them in and equip them and 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 help them to find their gifting. And so that's kind of that strategy there. So, Benji. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with everything you guys are saying. Do you appeal on Sunday mornings at C-Dubs very often, or how do you do that? Occasionally. Okay. Um, I do think there are some different dynamics with a uh, with like a smaller church. Um, I think at a place like East Vancouver, uh, one reason you wouldn't want to make that appeal is because there are so many people, so many non-members, so many visitors. It's, I don't know, like you don't know. It might actually be more difficult because you have so many people coming forward that you don't really know or... You would rather that happen, like you said, in relationship with your leaders recruiting and doing those things. Um, I think in a small church setting, you know, sometimes I make the appeal because it's like, as we were kind of revitalizing it, almost kind of starting from square one, it was like, just for us to be a church and do the basic things that a church is going to do, like we're going to need this to be a team effort. And there are times where Again, it's it's far from ideal, but like we need people just to step up for temporarily and just fill the role, regardless of if it's their passion or they want to do it, just so that we can have church, you know, that we can gather. But yeah, long term, you definitely want to. I mean, we do the find your place class at CW where we're helping people figure out what are their spiritual gifts, what are their passions, what are their experiences, and how can they use those in the church because we want people to to serve where they have gifting and passion because like you said that's going to be um going to be the best so yeah i agree we never want to come across from the pulpit or from up front as like desperate or um that that's how we um view it you know as like it, we, we have to have somebody or else you know we can't can't do it but yeah. i think um i had a thought about uh i just lost it I, I like how you say, like, come across as desperate, and I, I totally agree with that. And I think the reason we don't want to come across that way is because we're not. Like, we truly aren't. Like, we know 
doctrinally speaking, like we we understand the Lord's going to build His people, that He's building the church. That, like you said, Tyler, there are like certain certain ministries that um, are like uh, these core areas that need to be populated with service, and so we put resources there to hire people in those areas to recruit and to equip and do those things. And and I, the other thing that comes to mind is like we're playing the long game. You know what I mean? Like if we were just trying to accomplish. Man, I just need we just need to get this certain ministry populated so that it can you know uh, drive growth of some sort or whatever else. Um, it would be one thing, but it, we're we're kind of playing the long game of discipleship week by week, and uh, at the church, and so that that kind of leads into our general principles on that area. Our class over here is uh, Ben's is called Find Your Place. Ours is called yeah, it's called Purpose in Place. Purpose in Place. And, yeah, yeah, we we're still refining it. Like yeah. Luke and I wrote it last year. We ran it once, and we're still kind of like figuring out the best avenue for that. Um, but it also is a part of our NGC one hundred and one, yeah. and even our Step One, which is like the, kind of the really introductory thing. That's where we make the appeal, right? And yeah. so, like Step One is like, hey, you, like I did it two weeks ago, and there was a woman there who I was like, how long have you been around NGC? She's like an hour <laughs> like yeah, yeah. she it was her literal first day and there's somebody else in there who've been here like for six months and so our goal in there is to kind of just give them a basic overview of who we are and then give them six potential next steps as they are moving along in their time at ngc and uh three of those are in the area of just connecting and three of those in they're in the area of contributing and we always say like hey you're all at different points for some of you like our first connect next step is simply to keep attending right because you might have been here an hour, like um, the lady was a couple weeks ago. Um, and so like that is the thing to do. Um, uh, but then, uh, you know, there's community groups and NGC 101 for connecting. And then but on the on the contribute side, that's where we dive into like, hey, like serving is the first thing we mentioned in there. You know, as the church we serve, and I always like lay out like 90 plus percent of what you've witnessed um, from this church uh, has happened by volunteers, right? Um, we talk about the coffee cart, the kids ministry, the feeding the hungry stuff that happens in the community, all this stuff. And so like we do it in step one, we do it in even deeper dive in NGC 101. So if somebody's coming into membership uh, and then the member interview has that, that layer as well. Um, and so, and then the other thing is we didn't do it this past time, but previously at our member nights, that's where we make the appeal for here's where the biggest areas of need are. Because those are the folks who are like, I'm committed, like this is us, not just this is you guys. And so like, there, I think it was a uh, last year at one point, there was two areas of ministry that I was like, hey, if you're not involved yet, or you're looking for somewhere new to get involved, here are two areas that like really need help. Um, and so if you have any passion for that at all, like jump in and do that. Um, and so, yeah, so we've done that, but like that was specifically to our members. Um, another thing we've done, and it's been a minute, is, uh, is like a serving emphasis for like a month. Like for the month, we talk about it every week for four straight weeks. And uh, we'd love to help you find your place. And in, in that spot, we don't say, we, we really need help in the kitchen or anything like that. Um, but we say, here are all the different areas where you could get involved. And here's like the, the basic flow of how to do that. Um, one thing that came up though, as you were talking, Ben, is I feel like even in my time here in GC, East Vancouver has grown a lot. And as we've grown, the number of events that we do that are all hands on deck has decreased drastically, mm -hmm. right? And so that might be a size dynamic thing where it's like, I mean, you guys have a big Saturday um, Easter egg thing. Like I imagine like that's probably very much like an all hands on deck. Hey, like you've been announced on Sunday mornings, come help, stuff like that, you know? Yeah, um, I mean, I'm doing like the message to the kids as the lead pastor. So it's like everyone's kind of helping and... I think like we've talked about the larger your church, the larger your staff, you can be more uh, specialist yeah. than generalist. I think that's the same with volunteers in a smaller church. We have to kind of wear more hats than maybe at a larger church just because of the number of uh, people. Um, I think another thing I was thinking about was, and this is actually the beauty of kind of doing maybe like a church plant or revitalization starting from square one is we didn't day one say, okay, because this would have led to desperation. We have to have men's ministry, women's ministry, youth ministry, this ministry, and we got to staff it all. We said we're going to do, you know, Sunday morning gathering, kind of the core things, but then we've been able to build ministries organically where we don't say we're not just going to have a women's ministry because we feel like we have to, and then our staff burns out, or we have people in that role that aren't thriving there. We've waited for people to say, hey, I think we should do something there, and I actually am passionate about that, and that's where I think the Ephesians 4 comes in, where now my role is to equip them, resource them, support them. 
And then we've had people now turn into deacon roles in those ministries. And so that's been kind of cool because then you do have people in that place where they're passionate and gifted. And, uh, and that's happened with men's and women's and youth at, at CW. And so to be able to do it kind of organically like that is better. I think in a more established church, if they've had those ministries forever, then it's like that pressure. You might have to be a little more desperate because like, we can't not do this. Yeah. Like it's got to be staffed. Or if we weren't, sure. but at CW, we weren't doing any of that already. So it's yeah. like, we're not going to do it until we have the people to do it. Yeah. That's yeah. different. Yes. We, we did that here, you know, in the revitalization years, we inherited a certain culture that had, you know, all those different ministries or the more packed calendar and, and sort of the, the, the hobby horses or the, the sacred cows that, that were, man, this is just the thing. Right. And we let those die out over yeah. the first couple of years, or we just shut them down at times and just like, this isn't and built it and, back up. Yeah. And then you lose people and whatever else, but then it, it built that model that you're talking about where it's like, organically speaking, as the body grows, it builds itself up in love and people are equipped to serve and the areas that they're passionate about, you know, it, it works. So yeah, it's, it's not the field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. Yeah. It is the like once they're us, we will build it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like that, and that's slow and happens over time. And, uh, I can't tell you how many conversations I have with folks who are like, Hey, like the church should do this for us. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you and guys the, should do this. We're like, like, how about you do it? Yeah. Well, I wrote, I wrote an article a few years back on to be the church called no, you do it. No, yeah. man, <laughs> that came from, we get that all the time. Well, you need to do more of this evangelism or this outreach or this thing. And like, I love it. If that's a passion point for you, I, Ephesians 4, my role is not to do that. It's to equip you to do it. And a lot of times that's not what they're looking for. They're looking for the church staff to do what they think we should be doing. And not only is that like uh, not, not uh, appropriate for them to ask that, it's not healthy. Like it's not, it's not, it's going to burn out your staff and it's not going to be that good if, because no pastor or leader has every spiritual gift or passion. That's the beauty of the body. So we all got to play our own part to be built up. Yeah, I uh, I was speaking to a college class yesterday at George Fox University and like, singing for them, right? <laughs> it wasn't for them. It was like worship <laughs> songs. It was it was something. But uh, like we were uh, talk. I was just talking about Christian ministry and you know working in the church world, and uh, you know I I, was, I don't remember if somebody asked the question, but it came up where it was like like how do I know if I'm like picking a good spot to work at? right in the church world like how, how do i know if like i'm accepting a job in a spot that's healthy or whatever and I, I um i said you know there's a lot of answers to that for sure um but one answer is like look for a place that isn't trying to hire you to provide a service for people but is hiring you to equip those people to the ephesians 4 work of ministry that's good and uh and i, I think that you know and it can be annoying i'm sure people are annoyed with me when they come up and they're like and this happened like six years ago where people were like, we need a, a college ministry. Like I have kids coming into college and I don't want them to like fall away. And the conversation with uh, our leaders, not just me, but all of our leaders was like, we should have that. Like, are you like passionate enough to like, let me help you find another couple of couples and do it. And, um, and the, the answer was for them was a absolutely. And now we have a thriving young adult ministry that is led by folks who don't even have young adult kids in that ministry anymore, yeah. but are still, you know, a part of that and passionate about it. Yeah. And, uh, that that's happened over and over, but for every one of those, there's also, you know, maybe three or four where I'm like, yeah. And they're like, nah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I don't know. I, I like this question though. Um, cause, uh, and, and does any church do it perfectly? Like, no, I, I've been told before, like this church seems pretty big and it seems like you guys got it all covered. So I'm just here. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, that's a bummer. How can I, without having the Sunday morning plea, how can I communicate like that there are areas of need and like, yeah, like, I mean, I have met a musician a while back who was like, Oh, you guys, the band is just so good here. I just figured everyone was a hired musician um, and that you don't need people of the church to do it. And they they were really new. So they hadn't like seen the band members just like among the church, you know, uh, that they would at over time. But uh, yeah, so we got, we have some stuff to figure out in that regard too. But um, yeah, you got to protect your members too, who are prone to say yes to everything and then burn themselves out. Like yeah. that happens, especially in a small church. You you hear like the the old cliche, ten percent of the church is doing ninety percent of the work, and there's always those people that like I know I can call them and they'll show up and work, and that's great. And they usually have the right motives, but um, you're gonna burn them out. Like I actually want to encourage people like find one ministry that you are gifted and passionate and 
you know, I know that other ministry has a need, but like, it's okay. Like, it's not your job to fill every need. And so, yeah, we got to protect people from that too. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why this popped in my mind, but another thing, if you're on a church staff is everyone being on the same page about the desperation cry, right? Um, we've had it over the years here where there's been times where it's like certain ministries were starting to like struggle. And it was because like a single ministry was like, you have to be here and so like, and do this for us. Um, and it was like, there were the one mission church doing that. And so they were starting to get more people. Um, but people that were becoming unhealthy because they were getting burnt out and they were doing this out of the desperation or out of the, um, the frustration or not frustration, the, like the, just like the, the obligation and the, the feeling of like, if I don't help with this, the church is going to fall apart. And so like all the ministries of the church being on the same page in that regard that like, Hey, like we're going to get people in the right spot, not just sound the alarm until we get our stuff covered, you know, but you know, when you really hope you've done this well is when you're about to go on sabbatical. Cause that's how I feel right <laughs> now. It's like, Oh, it's going to have to not be all on me. So I think we are set up well, but yeah, the church should not be dependent on one or a small group of people. That's not the way it's designed. Yeah. Well, thanks for the question. Uh, we'd love to hear more. So podcast at to be the church.com in the comments on YouTube or on social media at to be the church is the place to get a hold of us. Have a great week. Happy Easter. Happy Easter.